Good morning or good afternoon or wherever you are. It's Matt Coleman, your host from Magnify World. Our company champions the augmented reality and virtual reality sector. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Charlie Fink from California. How are you, Charlie? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Matt. Um, interesting background for you. Uh, we're going to get into the entertainment business and also talk about XR and AR and VR and everything else. But you're uh, an XR consultant. Um, you're also an author. And, um, and Variety um, has also classified you. Hang on, I'm just going to get this right. It says they call you the XR explainer in chief. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit more because um, you've just released a book as well. You've got so many things going on. You're a writer at Forbes. You're, a, you know, working with various companies. Where do we start the conversation? Well, um, I'm also uh, an adjunct faculty member at Chapman University where I teach XR production and a course called Landscape of XR, which is essentially the contents of my first two books, Metaverse and Convergence. My new book is called Remote Collaboration Virtual Conferences, The Future of Work. And in that book, we look at almost all the collaboration sites. Unfortunately, there's some omissions because, you know, remote collaboration and virtual conference sites, it seems like there's a new one every day. ScienceBase just released one today called Breakroom, which is going to compete with Verbella, which is a simplified second life uh, for business. Excellent. Well, my background um, uh, is uh, involved starting out in the entertainment business. Um, then I worked in virtual reality in the 90s and, uh, you know, uh, produced Broadway shows uh, and then became a technology writer involved with virtual reality. And I can tell you my whole life story, but I'll try and do it as briefly as possible. Um, I got a job at Disney as a junior executive in the animation department. Uh, having bullshitted my way in there uh, and I had to make myself an expert in animation. It was a wonderful time to join there. I was very fortunate that a friend of mine was working for Bette Midler and she ran into the newly minted VP of animation who wanted someone who knew something about art. I had gone to the Art Institute of Chicago for graduate school uh, and also somebody who knew Hollywood story development, which I was doing for Gary Marshall, whom I had met uh, working as an assistant on a movie called Nothing in Common with Tom Hanks and the great late Jackie Gleason in Chicago in 1985. Yeah. So I joined G Disney as a junior executive and uh, the animation division was moribund. They had released The Great Mouse Detective, which was a failure, as was The Great Cauldron before it. There were about 60 people left in the animation division. Their median age probably was 55. And uh, they had decided they were going to make one new animated movie a year. So while I was there, you know, the studio ramped up to thousands of people, including offices in Orlando and Paris. And I was put in charge of developing stories for animated movies. And essentially, I took pitches from the outside. I organized pitches from the animators. I made pitches myself. And we were constantly going to my boss, to Jeff Katzenberg, and to Michael Eisner, saying, how about this for an animated movie? How about this? How about that? So one day, uh, you know, one of the things I did while I was trying to turn myself into an expert in animation was I watched all of Disney's animated movies, and I kind of broke them down. You know, were they musicals? How were the songs integrated? How many songs were there? How long were they? Who were the main characters? You know, and, and compared the movies. So uh, Bambi was, and we were looking for a movie that featured, you know, for boys. Because the Disney animated movies were by and large, what we called at the time, girl movies. And to, so to we were working on Aladdin, and, and we were and working on- the you were talking about before, sorry, last time we were talking. Um, tell us about, you know, how the Lion King sort of came about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, everybody wants to hear the Lion King story. Um, <laughs> here's the pitch. Here's how it went. Okay, now I didn't make the movie. I just came up with this one idea and then thousands of the most talented artists in the world, including Elton John and lyricist Tim Rice, you know, contributed their fantastic talents to the picture. So I by no means lay claim to the picture, only this pitch, which sort of was a little pebble that rolled down a mountain for years and, and ultimately was very impactful. Um, you know how Bambi begins with the great stag? You remember the movie? He's on the bluff yeah. overlooking the forest and below him is the thicket where 
his son is being born, Bambi. And the movie ends on the bluff with the great stag again overlooking the forest. But Bambi, now grown to a great stag himself, steps up next to him on the bluff where below them in the forest, Bambi's son is being born in a thicket. And the great stag steps away into the mist. And that's the end of the movie, right? The son replaces the father. Yeah. There is no greater theme in, in literature. Yeah. So that's, that was the beginning of it. And then, you know, Jeff Katzenberg, you know, was adding stuff and, you know, I mean, the script went through dozens of drafts with many, many writers, um, many great writers like uh, Ron Bass and, and J.T. Allen. So it was great. I mean, who knew that I would do the most impactful thing of my life when I was a 27-year-old um, junior executive at Disney? But it was a great time to be there. I made lots of friends for life, um, including my bosses. And, you know, it launched the rest of my career. I like to say that I got paid at AOL for what I did at Disney. And if you really think about what John Favreau did using the latest technology that you're a specialist in, what we love talking about is VR. Yeah. Um, you know, today, you know, I was lucky enough to go to the premiere of that. And I've seen a lot of behind the scenes footage of how he shot that, mm -hmm. you know, photorealistic movie. I mean, he actually uses the headsets um, and gets the perfect angle for every goddamn shot. I mean, it's yeah, well, virtual, virtual production using game engines is turning into a really big deal and will be hugely impactful to the industry. And what did you think? Um, if, I assume you, you may have seen um, John's latest version in the I, last I, 18 months. I, I thought it was a striking technical achievement. Uh, it was good because the Lion King story is a good story taken on its own. I think it suffered from a lack of humor that exists within caricature. So I, I thought that, that the story doesn't really lend itself to live action because it becomes darker. The realer it becomes, the darker it becomes. Mm -hmm. So I thought that the movie had a dark tone that the original was much more exuberant and surprising, Yeah, okay. if you will. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I think it would have been acclaimed as a great, great movie had it not been for yeah. the quality of the original. That's the risk you always take in remaking a, That's right. you know, a, a movie that is so big. You know, it's like if you remade Gone with the Wind, I mean, really, could yeah. you make it as well? You'd make a different version yeah. of Gone with the Wind. But that's not what Favreau did. And I think that may have been kind of its downfall because I don't think that the story was native to the kind of production they lavished on it. But the filmmaking itself was amazing. Yeah, and look, let's, let's also talk about what is the third golden age of Hollywood and the animation business? Because look what COVID has shut down the film business production wise. You know, we touched on virtual production and, you know, I'll let you explain to the viewers, you know, a little bit more about what that is, but this is, could be a lifesaver and for the Hollywood business because you don't need actors and massive sets. Well, animation is doing quite, <laughs> quite well during the pandemic. So a lot of shows got greenlit. We should see the result of that on streaming services soon. So uh, you're absolutely right. Animation and as well as virtual production to a lesser extent. Um, virtual production is using a game engine, um, but not to produce a game. Instead you produce, let's say a 3D set. And then you can shoot your actors on green scene green screen and insert them into wherever you want, a hyper-realistic virtual New York, or as they did with the Mandalorian, turn it into a you know, desert planet in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, I was also just seeing what they did with Westworld uh, with season three. Loved it. Loved <laughs> every minute of Westworld. Although the last season when it was in the real world and um, you know, she's running around killing people and I, I don't know it's not as good uh, let me put it that way i watched every episode with great anticipation but it uh -huh. wasn't 
first two seasons. I'm yeah, thinking. I'm talking about from the production because I know the director went on the Mandalorian set to actually. Oh, is, oh, is that right? I didn't even know that. That's cool. Yeah, that that's um, they just released uh, that only a few days ago. Probably this week, I saw that uh, background documentary. It's only five, ten minutes behind the scenes uh, director uh, to analysis of how they. Um, yeah, we're looking at virtual production techniques because of the, you know, the issues everybody's facing, I guess. Well, I mean, the other thing is, of course, it could save you, you know, tens of millions of dollars on a big picture, not to build a city, you know, That's right. and construct it. All you need to do is sort of build parts of it and the rest of it gets filled in by a computer. And tell us, uh, let's go back to your, um, your books, but the latest book is around the future of work, which is very topical. You probably released that at the best time in the history of man, because <laughs> everyone's trying to work well, out what we it out. We started the book in March with the onset of the pandemic, having no idea where it was going to lead. But, uh, you know, the book had a very, uh, you know, my class was quarantined. We were all, you know, everybody went home and we were working virtually. Fortunately, everybody had a VR headset. Uh, and so we were able to look at VR sites, but you know, most of these sites are PR, P, are PC based because you know you have to meet people where they are. Very few people own VR headsets, yeah. which is the best way to foster engagement, honestly, because they have presence. You have very little presence in a 3D world viewed through a 2D screen. And and by the way, you you navigate to a basic webinar inside of that 3D environment. So. I mean, webinars aren't very engaging. If you're in the audience, you don't have much, you don't have much agency. Uh, you have, uh, I suppose, the world's biggest distraction machine in front of you. <laughs> so you could be doing your email or whatever you want while you're supposed to be watching the professor. And uh, that is, you know, in a nutshell, the big problem with webinars and virtual conferences. Although for the two of us, I think it's better than, than a call because you know, we do have some body language and we can make some kind of um, virtual connection that we wouldn't otherwise make on the phone. So, um, you know, this is an example of meeting people where they are. Their app is very small. It downloads automatically, you know, but, you know, you look at some people who aren't digital natives looking around the screen to, you know, <laughs> to find the record or the share screen. Um, so you see this is, you know, people have to stretch to get to this technology and asking them to put on a head mounted dis display is an incredible leap forward. That's why I've always said, you know, the devices are being produced very slowly and it's probably just as well because like the PC in the eighties, people have to get, familiar with what it is and see it around and use it at work and use it at school and start to understand the value of presence. Yeah. Ironically, if we had been talking a year ago, I would have said VR is in trouble because it has no value proposition other than games. I'm glad you said that because but, I, wanted you to, I wanted you to talk about the bullish numbers from five years ago, you know, when I really started taking the industry seriously, and again, I think probably you did five or six years ago as well, it was going to be this $250 billion or trillion dollar market for all enterprise and consumer products. And then, you know, that, that's been revised now to probably 90, you know, 90 billion, which is still a big number. But um, what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, first of all, where are the headsets coming from? I mean, somebody's got to make 100 million headsets. So, okay. so far, so far we're at like 12. Yeah. So, um, you know, the scale is not there yet. People were investing now uh, and, and there has been a resurgence of investment in VR based on the pandemic and based on the fact that people, you know, if I told somebody a year ago, well, the killer app for VR is presence. You know, they kind of like, well, I have presence in abundance. I have presence wherever I want to be. I have total freedom of movement. So what you're offering me is something I already have. Yeah. But today we have, you know, presence is scarce. Yet it is the one thing we all crave. So VR, you know, is going to answer a substantial need for human connection for a lot of people. And, you know, the other problem is we are more separate today than we ever have been as people. You know, you go to a restaurant and everybody in the restaurant's looking at their phone. I went to an Irish pub. I remember I was hitchhiking around 
Ireland in, in the early 80s after I'd graduated from college. And I mean, people would pick you up hitchhiking and take you home. If you, you were afraid to go into a pub because once people found out you were an American, you, you would have to leave drunk from all the free drink. And yeah. literally you'd be sitting there and there'd be four pints in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I was at, uh, I, I think it was Collision, uh, which was in Dublin. And um, so uh, I walked into uh, a pub and everybody was staring at their phone and nobody gave a crap about an American. We were a dime a dozen. So, wow. uh, but, but that, that convivial atmosphere where people were fully present is gone. Yeah. The only way I can get that back is putting a VR headset on you and eliminating any possible distraction. It's, it's so true. And, and look, you're right. The price points aren't there yet because they're, they can be anywhere from $400 to $2,000 US, you know, depending on what you want. Um, we, we did a reveal on the, uh, the HP Reverb G2 gaming uh, headset recently, which is coming out um, on the blog as well. But that, I don't know whether you've looked into that, but the, the field of view and sound is supposed to be excellent um, although the price point's around 599 it's not really that 199 price point for mass market yet is it well well the the reverb that you're referring to the hp new hp headset is targeting enterprises right enterprises have really three tiers um, the very top tier is for designers who demand you know, very high end fidelity and they use things like um, Barjo headsets that, you know, cost $5,000, but are hyper real. So you can read the dials on the dashboard of a car that you're designing. So, and, and so it requires that kind of high fidelity. Now there's this middle level where you have some HTC Vive products like um, the uh, Vive Pro I, uh, you know, which is a terrific headset with, with reasonably high resolution that really most you know enterprises uh for design are going to use a pc based system but but the vive even the pro leaves something to be desired in terms of re resolution that's what the varjo solves so hp has kind of come to the middle of it and said this prosumer level you know needs a 600 hundred uh, dollar device you know it's more but you know the valve index is a thousand dollars and that's a consumer yeah. device so, uh, and, and they sold out of them because there is demand for higher resolution VR. I mean, the Quest, as much as I love the idea that I put it on and I'm just in VR and, you know, how much I love their interface, um, still, you know, it's screen door city, you know, you're not, the resolution is bad. You can't really read. I mean, if you've got like giant block letters and a sign, yeah, you can read it, but, you know, it's not appropriate for work. So the G2 solves that. Uh, if you, you've got a PC, which I think very few people have VR capable gaming PCs, they are still expensive. Uh, and, and during the pandemic, they started to get hard to find. Uh, and it didn't help that the prices went from about $1,100 to $1,600 to play. So the G2 uh, is a solution to that. I think its rival really is the index. Um, you, you know, because there's there's a huge yawning gap between six hundred dollars and and forty five hundred dollars. Mm. But the people paying forty five hundred dollars, it, it's a de minimis cost. The business yeah. is paying for it, and you know, think about the amount of money they're saving by not building plastic models or or clay models of things like cars. Yes. I mean, what since you've been, you know, over maybe over the last few years and with your writings and reviews that you do in Forbes, what do you think is a couple of the most exciting things you've seen in the market? In what, in what sector and, and what did really shock you? Uh, like, how did they do that type of thing? Um, well, I would say the, the thing I, that is influencing the industry and is commanding the most attention is the uh, Apple AR glasses. I think they're working on several different products, but there is one product that apparently is intended to disrupt the eyeglass business, right? So I could argue that this little piece of technology that is 400 years old is augmenting me just as my smartphone is. So this is augmented reality for me, 
right? As it is for you, I see you wear glasses as well. Half the people in the world wear glasses. So it's an annual industry that's worth about $250 billion. Yeah, yeah. So there's an Apple glasses product that looks like normal glasses, but is reading your retina and the environment at the same time and adjusting accordingly. So, you know, I'm, I've got 60 year old eyes. I mean, they're not great. They're not great in the dark. I feel at times a, a little nervous driving on the freeway, you know, with lights all around me and it's, you know, otherwise dark. Um, well, these glasses could eliminate that problem, right? These glasses, I could go outside and I'm now wearing sunglasses or it sees that I've, I'm outside wearing sunglasses, but then I start reading and it adjusts to reading. So this is potentially for a, somebody wearing eyeglasses, a, a, a life-changing device that could make tens of billions of dollars a year. And if you are a company at the scale of Apple, you have to do that. Um, I mean, look, you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested also in the integration of their existing products and how the smart glasses may interact with, and, and I know it's a bit of a, we're just open discussion and we don't know how that may happen, but you've just got to look at how they've done it with their smart watches, of course, right? Um, the other thing, of course, is I have been surprised uh, at how well Facebook has managed Oculus uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, they also have seeded the universe with over $200 million, which has created a lot of content and you know, funded a lot of brilliant people. So, you know, uh, Oculus, as much as I, you know, hate the echo chamber that Facebook represents for so many people, and, yeah. and I'm concerned about many of the privacy issues surrounding the platform, as well as its ability to control information. Again, I'm not paranoid that they are, but their algorithms have built-in biases that are intended to increase dwell time and page views, not to promote one truth over another. So, um, so given that atmosphere, they've taken Oculus and they really, there would be no VR were it not for Oculus, really. It yeah. would be, you know, would have been set back another five or 10 years. So I was surprised at how uh, important that's become and how well they've competed and executed against the likes of Apple, although we haven't seen um, the Apple device yet. Uh, other great stories, got to know Roni Abovitz a little bit, uh, learned a lot about Magic Leap, wrote about them in my second book. Um, you know, Roni is a entrepreneur who is full of surprises and Magic Leap will be a business case uh, study and it'll be a book that someone writes um, yeah. because, because their aspirations were amazing. Uh, their technology that they developed was impressive, um, but they just couldn't do it all themselves, yeah. not in the amount of time that they had. So, you know, Enreal, uh, which is uh, created by a former Magic Leap engineer, is using a different system where they have the optics, but that's the only thing that's in the headset. Everything else is tethered to a smart Android smartphone, right? Because there are going to be two categories of AR glasses, Apple and everybody else. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Android gang, if you will. And so you've got Geo and Samsung and lots of other people are coming out with AR glasses because they're going to compete to own that in um, Android. And it's going to be very much tied to the devices, right? Which one is going to compete ultimately with Apple AR glasses? Now, Apple AR glasses, my guess is 2022. I could be wrong. Um, I think its adoption pattern might very well possibly uh, mimic the iWatch, which has not been a failure, but you know, I often speak at tech conferences and one of the things I ask people is how many people are wearing an iWatch. And typically it's, you know, out of 300 people, maybe. Not me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I've usually got my phone in my hand, so I don't feel I'm like- No, I, I have no reason to have a tiny screen on my, uh, my arm. Although, although I did play golf about six months ago with a friend of mine, and I'm not that good at golf, and I play like three times a year. And we were playing with a guy who's a venture capitalist, and he was like Dick Tracy with his iWatch. I mean, he was just like talking to his wrist the whole time. And I thought, 
And he said, I don't take my phone out of my pocket almost ever. Really? Wow. So, so, I mean, there are people who are kind of living a watched lifestyle. My wife has an iWatch. I don't. She uses it for fitness stuff. Yeah. So, so I think that, that the iWatch, as the price comes down, will do better. But again, you know, getting people to change their behavior and wear a watch or wear a different pair of glasses is hard. That's why if they solve this problem, well, then they can bring along the weather or fitness or whatever else they want. But the main reason I would wear these all day, every day, is because it cor con connect, corrects my vision better than the old way, optical way, period. Yeah. And yeah. would I pay 1000 or $2,000 for that? Well, again, I'm fortunate. Yeah, I would. And I have the money. Again, I, that price point is going to be a barrier to many, many people. But the first adopters will happily pony up. It's sort of like buying the first iPod and uh, hard to resist. Well, I'll, I'll certainly be one of those people. I'm a big fan of smart glasses, um, where, it's, where it's headed, really. And I wish we were five years ahead, uh, but we're yeah, not. I mean, I always feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You and I are like minded then. But I, I wrote an article, um, you know, just a couple of pages, short, short article um, for the CIO magazine in Asia Pacific three and a half years ago. And it was about, um, you know, smart glasses and, and what the future may hold. And, um, you know, I'm probably completely wrong back then uh, because I was hoping it was going to be much sooner. But what I did describe in that article, which is what I wanted to get your opinion on, is um, the future of shopping um, and and how that could really impact this space because it's all around how do you create a Pokemon experience for different sectors of the market and that's going to be Apple's or anybody else's success with this I think. Well retail is obviously going to skew more toward entertainment. And, you know, malls are not going to be filled with hundreds of little stores, you know, selling jewelry. Um, you know, the mall is, is uh, going to be challenged to survive. I, I think what's going to happen is all these medium-sized local malls will probably become Amazon distribution centers and uh, the movie theaters will move toward, more toward attractions and experiences. But these are things that are gonna play out over dozens of years, but I don't see how the retail business survives in its current form. Now, its future form, and now when I'm talking future, I'm talking about 20 years in the future, its future form will probably be an entertainment venue filled with magic mirrors. And should you choose to buy the clothes or other things you see in the magic mirror, um, you know, the AR mirror where in which you see yeah. with the product and, and it'll be delivered just in time. You know, a, a you know, 3D printing factory will take that um, shirt that you ordered and uh, it'll be express delivered to your house within hours. Uh, perfectly fitted to your body today. Not the body you want, not the body uh, you used to have, but your body today. So I think that... Um, those technologies are being developed. It's a little bit like AR and VR. People are excited about them way before they're real. Yeah. But there are companies working on magic mirrors and they've been doing try-ons with, with makeup and glasses and hats, right. which are easy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, body matching and, and um, doing it well enough to make clothing is hard. So I, I'm not suggesting anybody's going to see, I mean, I doubt I would see it in my lifetime, but that's clearly where the puck is going. Just like where the puck is going is remote work, but it doesn't mean the end of the office. It'll mean the infrequency of the office. But there are many things that can't be done remotely. I mean, you know, I, my book designer and I on the third book, we, you know, produced it rem entirely remotely, but we've done dozens of projects together. And we used to work in person when um, she was running Blue Mountain and I was running American Greetings. So we had this established trust and it was very easy for us to collaborate uh, creatively. But uh, if you don't have that level of trust developed, uh, you know, you need to be proximate to people. You know, and there's a lot of creativity that happens because you mentioned something at lunch and I thought about it on the drive home and came and found you the next day to talk about it some more. Yeah. So you lose that when you go remote. 
Uh, you know, there's also the issues of succession, promotion, and mentorship, right? I mean, mentorship is, a lot of it is based on uh, familiarity, proximity, and repetition. So I'm not sure how that will work virtually. Right. That said, there's no reason for an engineer at Google who spends most of his time wearing headphones with his backs to his colleagues, uh, there's no reason for him to live in Silicon Valley, yeah. right? He could live three hours away and come in one day a week. Yeah. Or, yeah. or take the train in or whatever. And then he's living in a $300,000 house <laughs> on four acres of land with a fantastic school district. So um, I think that, that we'll slowly start to see that happen. In fact, it's already happening with Google um, and, and they'll have to figure out what the right balance of remote and present work is. And I think, by the way, a lot of companies will be entirely virtual. Um, but um, you know, I think it lends itself to things like logistics companies and not to companies that are inventing things. Yeah. So, you know, Zuckerberg has talked about his fear of losing an entrepreneurial edge by separating everybody. So I, I thought that was an interesting observation and possibly true. But again, it depends on the people, so much on the people. I had a, a good friend of mine who used to work for the old Cybel systems, if you remember, and they were purchased by um, Oracle. And so they kept the Cybel office in, in suburban Boston. And he was put on a team that was being run out of India that had engineers in Argentina and uh, Helsinki. And, you know, it was being run by the team in India. And he worked on that team for 15 years. And they met exactly once. Now, it may be the nature of their work, which was involved with training on the programs that the company was making, uh, yeah. didn't wasn't the kind of creative work that that required presence but obviously they did that job very well oracle is a huge company they kept adding people to the team yeah uh, so so there's an example of people who were working remote and and they didn't have to be together so you know this idea that suddenly remote work is new and that companies haven't been doing it for years is is fallacious we just weren't really talking about it but it's true that a pandemic like a war is, is going to accelerate certain things. For example, telemedicine, right? You yeah. could never get examined by a doctor and get prescribed drugs on the phone, right? I have, some, weird, I have right? some meds that I take for diabetes. And if my doctor doesn't see me in person every four months, she doesn't write the prescription. Yeah. But, but since the pandemic, we've only been having phone calls. So, you know, there was always this problem with telemedicine. Oh, there's the Hippocratic Oath. I can't, I have to see the patient in the flesh. I can't prescribe over the phone. And all those stupid rules are now gone. Bro, remote, I, wasn't aware, I, I wasn't aware of that. Remote no. education was for years, the Provence of homeschoolers and, you know, people who lived in remote rural areas or were urban pioneers or had some external reason for, um, or, or I should say some choice that they made that led to remote learning. But they were very small minorities, like less than 1% of all students were remote. So, uh, you know, academia, particularly, um, you know, elementary school, you know, K through 12 is tremendously impacted because a lot of what they do is socialization. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what they do is they teach focus. You know, and they, they, they ready us for the workplace and for life. You know, you have to learn to work with other people. And you have to learn to work with other people that you have not chosen. <laughs> well, not chosen for you by your parents. You need to be thrown together with a bunch of rando kids. Some of whom are bullies and some of whom are going to be your best friend for life. Because that's how you learn about life. So I don't think K through 12 education is going anywhere soon. I don't think there's going to be a ready player one remote high school because of the socialization issue. Charlie, what about, you know, all the, the, fem the females that are actually doing those roles as teachers um, and, and hospital workers to, I, I mean, a lot of them are out of work, right? Um, not necessarily the hospital workers, but in education in particular, 
um, or even, you know, you know, um, cleaning jobs or anything like that. And sure, any job allied with the physical world showing up. Uh, is number one has risks and, and a lot of those jobs are not don't exist anymore so and and some of them will come back and some of them won't uh, and the truth is I mean remote is going to be part of our lives now and we're going to have to figure out how to get good at it I had one student who emailed me earlier in the summer professor Fink it looks like we're not going to have in-person classes in person and being on campus and having that experience is the most important part what should I do Yes. You know, and it's expensive. Chapman is an expensive private university. Um, and I said, okay, that's legitimate. If the campus experience is what you think you're paying for, then don't do it because you can't replicate that online. If it's about your education and your preparation for the workplace, remote is important. You have to learn remotely. You're going to have to interact remotely. You're going to have to work independently. And this is where you get trained to do that. So let's talk about the future of education. Harvard is charging $50,000 for a Zoom online course. It enables a, a selected number of students to live on campus and they're not allowed to socialize and they get tested for COVID every two or three days. Now you've got, the, that's tier one, tier two and tier three are completely probably unprepared for this online education market and e-learning. I mean, there's going to be a percentage of those universities and colleges that go broke. I would say within 25 years, more than half of them will be gone. Um, some, the, the schools that survive will have either very large endowments, they will be state schools, or they will be schools where the brand can be sold. That's what Harvard is doing. They're selling a brand. You're buying a brand. Because the education that they offer, you could find online. You can study with the best professors in the world online through Coursera. But people don't do that because they want the brand. They want the degree from Harvard. They want the friends from Harvard, the, the network from Harvard. And that is what they pay $50,000 a year for, not for five online classes. Yeah. Well, it's certainly going to be interesting. And what do you think in our industry, in the AR, VR, or expanded reality, or the future of smart glasses is going to offer the education communities of the future. Now, in the, in the, in the shoot and right now, and maybe in the next couple of years, even, do you think that AR and VR is going to be stronger than ever? Oh, yeah. I think VR is going to figure tremendously in college education. I mean, it is that present in online? It will be present in high schools, but it will be super important in, in higher education and, and perhaps even in high schools because, you know, again, the engagement level is so high. You can't hide. You can't be distracted. Comprehension and retention goes through the roof when people are that engaged. I, know so, yeah, you, I think more things will be taught with virtual reality. Absolutely. Guaranteed. What, what about web-based AR? Do you think there's a, an opportunity for, for well, learning? Well, all AR will be based in the cloud. You won't need to download apps anymore. So that's one thing that will be different. Um, you know, the end of the app store, uh, you know, will be celebrated by many, uh, including Epic Games. <laughs> um, the, a joke based on, on the news. Uh, so, um, you know, anyway, yeah, I think it'll all be WebXR. VR and AR will be appless. They will just run off, off the cloud. But it, it probably is going to have to be something better than 5G to really do AAA multiplayer games. That's just too much data to put even on 5G. But then there's, you know, what, what you know, there's, there's quantum phone, uh, photonic, I think is the next one after 5G. So, you know, maybe that will provide a big enough pipe. Um, but, you know, they'll also do sort of dual rendering. So you could have an app for a VR game, and then you would be downloading additional material while you're playing the game. Right. You know, downloading the background. So I shouldn't say it's the end of the app because higher end apps are going to need a, um, a, a more robust foundation to send all the data they have to send. Excellent. And look, 
Um, we get close to wrapping up here. I wanted to ask you, could you leave some thoughts and some tips about if you're an entrepreneur today and you were looking at this industry and also if you are working for a corporate and you were looking at, at this burgeoning industry, what tips would you give them? Well, of course, it depends what industry you're in. But certainly, uh, you know, bringing game engines and virtual production into any entertainment venture is going to be very, very important. Um, the other thing I would say is 3D and volumetric production and volumetric television, you know, 3D without glasses, uh, is coming. And we will have 3D screens. Uh, a great example of that is the um, name of this company. Um, I think it's called Lightbox. They're based in Brooklyn and they make a, you know, for 3D artists, they make a small, like 18 inch 3D screen that they can put on their desk next to them. And that keeps them from hopping in and out of VR to check their work. But it also could potentially be a 3D television, you know, but the cost has to come down and there has to be content for it. But in terms of the opportunity for the future, yeah, I think volumetric entertainment and volumetric production, look, there you know, must be, you would know better than I, but maybe at least half a dozen stages around LA now that are you know, yeah. focusing on, on volumetric filmmaking. Uh, and it's especially relevant to games and, and you know, capture. Right, there's a lot of capture stages in LA work exclusively for the games business. Yeah. You know, because much exactly. easier. Much easier to animate an actor, you know, who's given you, given you some action and poses and expressions than it is to make those things from scratch, like a Disney movie. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic, Charlie. Look, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for having me, Matt. Always a pleasure to see you. And, and congratulations on your, your third book. Thank you. Um, and do you want to just give yourself a shout out, please, for your website so people know where to, where to find it? Sure, I'm uh, at Charlie Fink on Twitter uh, and charliefink.com, uh, CD Fink on Instagram and uh, Charlie Fink on LinkedIn. So uh, if you Google me, I'm one of the easiest people on the internet to find. And, and of course, um, if you follow me on social, you'll um, get notified and you'll see my shameless self-promotion from my Forbes stories, including my popular weekly column, This Week in XR, which comes out uh, on Fridays and, and we rehash the week's news and uh, I offer some perspective on what it might mean. Well, look, um, thanks again for your input into the industry uh, and your thoughts today. And um, we'll catch up again. And thanks very much for your time. All right, Matt, have a good day. Thank you, John.